Hello and welcome to North Country Matters, now in our 15th season. My name is Bess Kearney, your host today. I am a member of the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters, one of the civic partners for this show. I'm here today for a conversation with Samantha Jones, marketing manager and community education educator at Hospice of St. Lawrence Valley. Welcome, Sam. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> As you all know, April 15th is an important date. This is tax filing deadline. What most of you don't know is that April 16th is an equally important day. It is National Health Care Decisions Day. So talk about death and taxes. This is something to remember. Samantha is here to raise awareness about this day, National Health Care Decisions Day, and discuss the importance of advanced care planning, a phrase you'll get to know, and communicating your end-of-life wishes. So, Sam, start us out. What is National Health Care Decisions Day, and how did it get started? So, National Health Care Decisions Day is this national initiative to really bring the right information, um, make access to advanced care planning easier. It was started in 2008 by a Virginia-based healthcare lawyer who saw that there was this kind of disconnect between what people wanted and what they were getting when they were being treated. Um, and so the, the big goal of National Healthcare Decisions Day is to demystify the healthcare decision making. Um, make it a conversation that everybody can kind of understand and can tackle. So. Um, it's a series of independent events, um, so communities all over the nation on April 16, um, healthcare facilities, providers, nonprofits like ours, they'll be hosting, um, you know, educations, walk-in workshops, they'll do, you'll see media campaigns. The real goal is to make this a topic that's inescapable, so that on April 16, everywhere you go, you can see a, did you sign yours sign, or, or something like that. Um, we really want people to be proactive in their health care and not just reacting to medical uh, crisis as they arise. Okay, so who is this education intended for? I mean, is it for the elderly, those who already have a final prognosis? Uh, how young or old do you have to be to do this? This is aimed at everyone age 18 and older. Really, everyone who's a legal adult should have some sort of advanced health care in place. Um, having a decision maker, having someone that's there to make decisions for you. Um, I think the last estimate I read was like 20 to 30 percent of Americans actually complete their advanced directives. Wow. That's not a big number. So really we want everyone to be doing this, this, this um, be part of this conversation. Not just people that are maybe at the end of life, not waiting until you've been diagnosed with an illness, but being proactive like I said, right? Doing, um, planning now before you need it, kind of. Well, and hopefully our viewers will get that message and, and dive, yes. dive right in. Uh, but you've mentioned the term advanced care planning a couple of times and advanced directives. What, what is that? So advanced care planning is all about planning about the what ifs that could happen. Um, it's like I said, it's about creating a health care plan now before you have or in a crisis event or should be diagnosed with a serious illness. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's similar to, you know, you have a, a, an escape plan for your house, an emergency plan, right? You and your family, in the event if there was a fire, you all feel better, right? Because you, you've had a plan, you've talked about it, you know what to do. Same thing, you hope to never use it, but if a medical crisis came up, you, can, you feel um, better knowing that you have a plan. Your family knows about your plan. Um, so that's what advanced care planning is all about. So, you know, think about it, really is how you get started, is what would you do, what would happen if, you know, you were in some sort of sudden accident that left you unresponsive, you couldn't make decisions for yourself? Oh. Do your family know enough about what you wanted, um, and are they comfortable and confident enough to make decisions on your behalf? Wow. This sounds like a pretty big undertaking to tackle. I, for, what you're talking about is each of us facing and accepting our mortality. Yes. Um, this is a topic that is easily brushed off, quickly avoided. It's one of those, like, you know, you almost have blinders on to it. Um, we live in a death-denying culture, and, you know, but 
we are all going to die. It is hopefully years from now, um, but it's going to happen. And you know, with the, the, when you finally accept your mortality and you accept that your time here is finite, um, it, it takes this whole burden off. It almost like gives you this freedom to live your life exactly how you want to. Mm -hmm. Because really what advanced care planning is about, what end of life planning is about is making the decisions now, putting the plans in order so that the rest of your life is how you want it to look. So you get both the good life and the good death. Wow. Um, mm. So uh, the Conversation Project, which is a big player in this national campaign, they have a statistic on their website that says 80% of Americans say they want to die at home. When asked what's a good death, they want to die at home. Yet, nearly 70% of Americans every year are dying in institutions, are dying in hospitals, nursing homes. Um, and about a third of them spend their last week in an intensive care unit on an intubator or comatose. So, simply just saying you'd like to die at home is not a plan. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. So, saying things like, you know, if I'm ever that bad, just shoot me. <laughs> That's also not a plan. That's illegal. I've heard that, though. <laughs> yeah. You really want to develop a, a comprehensive health care plan, an actual plan. Okay, so what does a comprehensive health care plan, big <laughs> what does it look like? What's so it? it really just, it's, it, it sounds bigger than it is. It's, it's answering straightforward questions about the kind of life and death you want. So it's questions about, you know, where do I want to be? Um, what am I going to do if I can no longer be independent? Um, what, what are my desired outcomes? What's an, undes what's an outcome I, I simply is un unacceptable? What's a good day look like? Wow. It's thinking about, um, it's a lot of self-reflection, um, putting your, your values you know, in front of you and saying, this is what's important in my life, this is what I can live without, um, and then answering those questions. Uh, okay, but that's a lot of decisions to make on your own. It, it, it kind of, to me, it sounds a little bit overwhelming. Uh, so, do you have some suggestions on where people, where I would begin? I do. Um, it is, it is such a daunting, overwhelming topic. My first tip is don't try to tackle it all in one day. Um, this is an ongoing conversation and project. It really should be. Um, but the first thing. Um, I have it kind of in a, a five-step checklist, right? Okay. So the first step is sit down and take the time to thoughtfully and carefully consider what matters most to you. What are the things that make your life worth living? Um, what are the things that bring value and quality to your life? And then think about what of those things can you live without? What are things you absolutely cannot live without? So we talk a lot at hospice about being Mortal by Dr. Atul Gawande. Oh yes, great book. Um, we, great yes, book. we love that book. Yeah. So in the book, right, he talks about two patients. One says to his daughter, as long as I can eat chocolate ice cream and watch football, I'm okay dealing with all sorts of physical pain or disabilities. And then he talks about his own father who says, I just want to maintain my social life because for him, being sociable and then he's still being able to mentor and teach, that was what was important. So, you know, it's different for everyone. Um, but you could imagine, you know, in his father's case, if he were to lose the ability to speak, it would drastically reduce his quality of life because that was what was important to him. Yeah. So it, that's, that's the first time. It's really talking about figuring out what's adding quality to your life and weighing it against the quantity of time you want. So that's something only you can answer, only I can answer. Yes. Wow. Or to do some soul searching when you have to do this. Right. The second step, um, and this is sort of, you know, I say steps, but these are probably happening simultaneously. Okay. But the next step is, you know, if you're thinking about what's important, you're thinking about these hypotheticals of, you know, for me, being outside is important. So what happens if I'm in an accident that I can't be independent or I'm immobile and I can't get outside and go hiking? You know, things like that. So what does my life look like afterwards? Um, and what you're, the next step is you're, you're looking at what kind of medical care do you want to receive in the event of XYZ, in the event of an accident, in the event of a terminal diagnosis. Um, what, what do I want? What do I not want? What am I willing to sacrifice? Because all these medical treatments are going to come with a side effect or an adverse effect. Um, so 
this is the this is the step where you really want to start doing the research researching the different medical treatments that are common for your certain hypotheticals researching um, what are life-sustaining treatments what will they look like so when you say life-sustaining treatments you're talking about things like uh, DNR, do not resuscitate, things like that? Yes, yeah, so life-sustaining measures are any treatment intended to keep your physical body alive. Um, and it can be CPR, a ventilator, feeding tubes, um, you know, certain antibiotics and surgeries, things like blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. um, doctors use life-sustaining measures when some part of your body essential for living is no longer functioning. And it may ease pain, it may keep you alive, but in a lot of, in many of the cases, it just simply prolongs the person's death, keeping them in that intensive care unit where they might not have wanted to be, and it just reduces their quality of life. So life-sustaining measures won't save your life necessarily, and I think that's the big misconception, right? It sounds like, life support sounds like life-saving, they're going to save my okay. life. Okay. And we have, you know, the TV and movies and Hollywood to yeah, think for right. how pretty life support looks, right? Have you ever, um, you know, you ever seen on TV someone go into cardiac arrest? Yeah. You know, it's a scene and for five minutes they're doing everything and then all of a sudden the person's fine, they're sitting up, they're talking, no problem. That magic CPR. Yeah, that, yep, that yep. magic. So everyone's walking around going, well, if I have CPR, I'll cut, it'll be fine. They'll, they'll just bring me back and I'll go on with my day. Mm -hmm. The reality is, it's not that simple, and it's not that pretty. Really? You know, so I'll ask people is, do you know what CPR encompasses? Not that it's right or wrong to want, it's everyone's personal preference, but... I've done it, know. I've done it on, on a dummy. And, right, not the same thing, <laughs> no. right? I would imagine that even, even um, you know, medical students have no idea what it really is until they're on their residency being told, start chest compressions, right? Yeah. And it's it's not that pretty scene like it is in the movies. Mm -hmm. So for CPR to be administered is when a person goes into cardiopulmonary arrest. They're not breathing, their heart is stopped beating. So two of their main things for, for, for living are not working. So they're kind of dead? They're, you're basically at, with CPR asking for people to be brought back to life sometimes. And CPR does work in some cases, right? We, you know, if it's administered Immediately, if the person is young, you know, there's lots of times that it works. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about CPR on, you know, someone in their 80s. Okay? CPR really looks like um, torture. Torture is the word I'm going to use. Oh. So the, the force that it, make, it takes to do proper chest compressions requires the performer to break through your ribs. Break through all that protective cage around your heart. Because right, they need to get to it to pump it physically. Yeah. So, should you survive CPR, that's great, but you're going to wake up with immense pain from broken ribs. You'll have bruising. Mm -hmm. You know, the next piece of it is they're going to want to bag you, and put and try to get long air into your lungs to get it to your brain. Well, it's everything's happening fast, so when they put the tube in your throat, they might miss the first time, and then it's pumping air into your stomach. Take it out. Do it again. So should you survive and wake up, what's going to happen? You're going to have difficulty swallowing, pain talking, you know, abrasions in, throughout your esophagus. Yeah, yeah, yikes. <clears throat> so these are all important things to be aware of when you're thinking about whether or not you want these. Yeah, and like I said, we're not saying CPR is bad because we know it's good in some cases, but we're thinking, you know, if you're in your 80s and you have a history of chronic illnesses, CPR is going to do more harm to you than good. I think the survival rate, uh, the last I read, was about 40%. And of that 40% who survive being brought back through CPR, about half actually uh, stabilize enough to be even discharged from the hospital. Oh. And half are going to go into cardiac arrest again and eventually die in the hospital. Okay. And so what we're talking about is CPR, you know, I have... I have in my own um, living will that I would want measures taken now. But if, you know, I would I definitely change that the more I age, should I develop ailments. And that's the other thing with National Healthcare Decision Day is it's every year. Every year you're going to look at these health plans. Oh, yeah. Very so good. really what we want people to do is in this step, you're doing the research. When I say, so if I say, yes, I want everything, make me a full code, 
doing the research, just not, not only what does that mean, but what does it mean, what's your life going to look like afterwards? Because I think that one of the things is people don't think about the consequences. And so is, is, are these life support measures worth having a life of no quality afterwards? Mm -hmm. And as you're saying, some of the, the decisions you would make this year on April 16, they're going might to yeah. change as, as you get older. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wow. So if a person doesn't want any life-sustaining treatments, uh, is a DNR order enough? No. Oh. So here's this other misconception that we're trying to, you know, educate the public on is a DNR just means no CPR. Um, it, which is confusing, right? It, wouldn't you just like it to say no CPR, not do not resuscitate? And so many individuals will think, well, I have a DNR, so that means I won't get anything. But you could still, you know, you could still receive other life-sustaining measures. Your advanced directive or completing a MULSE with your doctor is where you can write in, I do not want a feeding tube, I do not want to have a ventilator. There's a separate form that says it's called a DNI, do not intubate. So, you know, again, with this the confusion that's out there about healthcare decision making is not even knowing that you have to have a form for everything. Yeah. You yeah. know? Now, I, I've seen this. You, you call it a MOLST. Mm -hmm. What's that? So, it's, um, it stands for Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. Okay. It's mostly used with patients that have chronic illnesses um, or life limiting illnesses. They don't necessarily have to be terminal yet. Um, the difference between that and another advanced directive is this one has to be completed with a medical provider, signed by a medical provider. But it does a great job of really spelling out the difference between DNR and other life support measures. Okay. Giving you spots to write in, you know, you update it all the time annually and you can say this is where I am in my disease, these are my decisions now, and you can change it just as much as everything else. And you do that with your doctor? Yes. Oh, that's and, excellent. You know, this is, this form is one of those rare forms that your doctor actually knows about because they're st sitting with you, filling it out, and signing it. Oh, that's good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you've given us two steps. One, one is self-awareness, and then the other one is uh, about life-sustaining treatments. Mm -hmm. what, what's next? What else should we be doing? The next immediate thing is you're going to want to pick your decision maker, your advocate, your healthcare proxy. Okay. Okay. Um, in in other states, this might be um, a healthcare agent. It's also known as durable medical power of attorney. Um, so it has a couple different names depending on where you live. In New York State, we call it a healthcare proxy. Okay. And there's a legal form for that that doesn't require a notary or any you know attorney signatures. It just needs to be signed and witnessed, and it's legally binding. And this so your healthcare agent is the person who is going to make decisions for you should you become unable to make them yourself. So you want someone that um, knows you well, obviously, someone that is respectful of your preferences and wishes, and someone that has time to help you. Okay, so maybe someone, if something happens to you, won't be a total emotional wreck and not Correct. able to... Correct. So yeah. if, you know... Um, if you, people write their first thought is their spouse, their firstborn child, okay, okay. maybe those, that person's not the right person because they're emotionally overwhelmed in situations or they can't handle conflicting family members because oh. there's always someone that's got a different opinion. So you really want someone that's essentially got like a strong backbone who will um, be a strong advocate for you. So a, bit, a strong advocate against doctor, uh, unresponsive doctors against combative family members, someone that, if you can't speak for yourself, is going to stand there and, and speak for you and carry out your wishes for you. Wow. I suggest not picking someone, you know, that has ever been combative when you've talked to about your wishes. You know, if you've talked to your, you know, your child, maybe it's your daughter, whatever, and they've been combative about it or, no, 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 you don't want that, that's probably not the right person to pick. Okay, good advice. Um, but the other really neat thing is you can appoint more than one agent. And actually, I always recommend at least having two when I talk to people about this. Um, more than one agent really just helps to ensure that your wishes are carried out. It helps them because it's they can make these decisions together rather than facing them alone. 
And it also is just more players on your team to advocate for you. Oh, good advice. But the, these are these are people that really have to get into the nitty gritty of what they have to know you, mm -hmm. and then they have to know your preferences, and you have to trust that they'll go along with them. So correct. So okay. you know, it's, I've already eliminated. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's easy to pick who you wouldn't want, right. and then of course the other. The other thing is, you know, this person might be your ideal candidate, but if they say, I'm not comfortable, don't push them either. All oh, right, right. And it, it, it can't be your doctor, right? It cannot, thank you. Um, the, it cannot be anyone under the age of 18, and it cannot be your own medical provider, or, you know, if you had a relative that worked directly for your medical provider. Oh, you know, there's, okay. there's that's where it is. Um, so... I think the most common is people appoint their spouse, um, a sibling. Um, yeah. I personally have two. Um, mine is my significant other yeah. and my brother. Uh huh. And so I have two because I think, I mean, I, I would trust both of them to make the decision alone, but I think that I feel almost better knowing that they would have each other to, to make decisions for me. Right. And then it's not all necessarily falling on one. So, right. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of, you know, not I think, they, people do, they, people feel guilty in their decisions, you know, and that's why it's not just important to have the proxy, but to be having these conversations with them so that if they're making a decision that deep down is uncomfortable, they're mm -hmm. at least knowing that they honored your wishes. And, not and they don't have guessing. to, yeah. and they're not, they're not yeah. spending the rest of their life going, did I make the right decision? Oh, yeah. Because you definitely don't want to burden someone with that, that guilt. Yeah. Well, and that's, a, that's, that's one of the major reasons why you should be doing this, planning ahead. Yes. So, no, nope, they're not shooting from the hip. Yes. So, yeah. so what, what exactly can your health care agent, medical power of attorney, whatever, your health care proxy, what, what decisions can that person make? So they decide what kind of medical care you receive. So mm -hmm. treatments, surgeries, the hospital you're in. They can decide what doctors can treat you. Um, so if they don't like a doctor and they're not doing it, they can get you a new one. They can decide where you live. Um, so they could make the decision if you need home care or if you can't stay at home and you need to be moved into long-term care somewhere. And then they can also make the decisions about personal care. So what, what you're fed, who feeds you, who bathes you, things like that. But this is... Just to clarify, this is only if I can't speak for myself. Correct. Okay, so they can't, if I'm making my decision. If you're all hunky-dory, they can't just walk in and say, I don't know, we're doing this now. <laughs> okay, good. This is, good, you know. um, yeah. a medical doctor will have to declare that you're unable to make decisions for yourself. Okay. So, um, you know, this would come at, this would come at different points. It could be for different reasons. You could have been in an accident and are unresponsive. Mm -hmm. It could be due to a diagnosis and they've decided that, you're not capable of making correct decisions. So dementia? Dementia is one, yes. Yeah. Um, so this person, this job only takes effect should you lose the ability to make your own decisions or if you can't speak for yourself. Um, I would recommend your healthcare proxy if it's someone that can come to some doctor's appointments with you so they can get to know your doctor. Oh. But, you know, they can't, if it's, right, if it's your, your daughter or something, they can't be in the, the doctor's office, you know, answering all your questions for you. Okay. You're still doing that yourself. Okay. All right. So uh, you've outlined a few steps. What, what's next? Put it all in writing. So the next step is important. This is where you can take everything you talked about, everything you thought about, researched, your decisions you've made, and you're going to fill out the proper forms. Because, like I said earlier, just talking about the plan, just making a plan, doesn't make it official. So you're going to want to, depending on what state you're in, you're going to want to fill out the, the appropriate documentation. So in New York State, we have an advanced directive. Um, it's this booklet right here. Within this booklet, you have the ability to appoint your healthcare proxies and complete your living will which is, the living will is essentially your instructions for your healthcare proxy. They're the if this, then this type of thing. Oh, nice. What's neat about this book, um, 
is in the back you can cut out this square and you can put it in your wallet. So, you know, the ideal place is you put it right behind your ID in your wallet. And so if you were in an emergency situation and the first responders were looking for ID, they'd pull out your ID and see a card that says, this is my healthcare proxy with their phone number. So the book has a little template for that where you can cut it right out. That's very nice. Yeah, I that's think that's great. a neat, you know, that's one of the questions I have is, well, if I have it, how do people know about it? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> wow. So, uh, where, oh, well, first of all, quickly, where can I get that? So these books can actually be obtained for free from Hospice of St. Lawrence Valley. No. And not even just on Healthcare Decision Day. Any day of the year, you can contact me at Hospice. You can drop in and you can get a free copy of either of this booklet. Um, you can access all of these documents through the New York State Department of Health website, um, through different nonprofits like the Conversation Project, CaringInfo.org. They have all these documents. And then we have to make it easy for you, if you go to the hospice website, we have a section dedicated to all of these these documents so you can quickly and easily download them. That's nice. Yeah. Okay. Because right, um, we don't care what your decisions are. We really don't. We just want people to be having these conversations and be talking about this. All right. So is, is there a next step? Yes. So the last step. It's a lot, right? Yeah. No wonder people are avoiding it so okay. much. <laughs> so I've got all my, I'm, I, I, I've been introspective, I've decided about any uh, medical interventions, I've, I'm sure I'm going to miss something, I've chosen a proxy, I've got the paperwork done. The I last step not... is to talk about it. Okay. Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Everything you, everything that you did in those first four steps, you need to communicate with your family and with your doctor. Just because you have an advanced directive doesn't mean it will necessarily be followed. If people don't know about it and they don't understand the reasoning behind your decisions, it's less likely that they can um, fully understand your wishes and therefore fully fulfill them. So you need to communicate this with your family and be, you know, be receptive of their, of their opinions and responses, but you know, at the end of the day, ex explain this is, this is how I want to live my life and these are the measures I've put in place to do that, and I would appreciate that you know you respect my wishes. Um, but the big piece, right, is make sure your doctor knows you have a proxy. Make sure your doctor knows you have an advanced health care plan. So many times, maybe families are told, but the physicians themselves, I think it's like 6% was the doctors that knew that their patient had an advanced directive, in, even in their file. So you really, if you filled all this out, which I would suggest bringing your decisions and talking to your doctor about them before you even sign it into legal, um, into being legal. But once it is signed, once all these documents are signed, not only are you going to talk to people about it, but you're going to share copies of them. So your doctor needs a copy to put in your chart. Your proxy should have copies. Anybody close to you that would be um, present in a medical situation should have copies of all of your advanced directives and healthcare plans. Okay. And I, I personally would suggest having a contact, even on your refrigerator, for who is your proxy. You know, just, just make it easier for someone to, to find out. Okay. I have to tell you, uh, uh, not too long ago, I had a medical procedure at the local hospital, and. My doctors, knowing that I have some of these documents, the, the check-in, when I called to pre-register, <laughs> they said, well, if you have any of these documents, bring them in. And they, I did, they scanned them into their system. So now I know, if I ever end up in that hospital, they have your records. They Isn't do, that right? Yeah. And then, of course, as I change my mind, I'll, <laughs> I'll have to show, make new scans. I know, yeah. but that's, that's very heartening to know that it's, it's it, kind of in the system. Yeah, so, yeah, that's good. To um, because, like we talked about this this education campaign, while it's really geared towards the healthcare consumers, a lot of the education is for providers and facilities as well. Um, making sure that there be you know, ask your patients about do they have a, a plan? Because I don't, 
I can't I can't remember one time I ever I've ever been asked by a doctor if I have a health care plan. It's probably due to my age, but yeah. Still, I'm over eighteen, someone should ask me. But having you know, educating the doctors on why why to ask, talking you know, why to take the time to talk to your patients about that, and really educating them on <clears throat> being respectful of their wishes and not just simply, you know, doing their job and going about their treatments. So if your doctor br doesn't bring it up, you can. You should. Okay. Yes. Um, and it, it's it's like any other conversation. Don't wait for don't wait for someone else. If it's important to you, just start it. Yeah. Just talk about it. Yeah. Excellent. So tell me about a Hospice of St. Lawrence Valley and what's their involvement on April 16th when we filed our taxes. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and now we have to look at something that it doesn't have a legal penalty. It doesn't necessarily have a monetary penalty. But th there is a downside if you're not looking critically at those decisions. So how is hospice involved? So on April 16th, um, we're hosting um, a day-long open house. Um, so anytime between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m., anyone can drop in. They can get information about advanced care planning. They can pick up the actual materials to complete it. There's staff available to talk to about, you know, the questions with the decisions. Um, we've compiled resources that people can take home um, to fit it, to do not only just the healthcare component of their planning, but you know, to further that and do their financial planning suggestions for um, some of those other end of life matters that you want to tie up. As you know, we've been doing um, monthly lunch and learns yes. for the last year plus. And so every topic has been geared towards something towards end of life. So we've done, you know, we've done you know, plan your funeral now. Um, coffin club. The coffin club, I, which is great. coming up That's next month. Yes. This month. Um, you know, you did the death cleaning one, which is something right there that people overlook. If you've lived in the same home for 60 years, I mean, it's full of all sorts of stuff. And for most people is, well, it's my kid's problem when I die. Uh -huh. But guess what? They don't want your stuff. <laughs> So True. we've been, you know, we've little by little been trying to plant this seed um, in community members and start these conversations. So we have um, April 16th falls on the regular, regularly scheduled day for a lunch and learn, but rather than just, you know, minimizing the time we spent on it, we want it to be a day long thing. We want people to feel comfortable coming in and getting these materials. Um, it, it's really just about the, the awareness. Excellent. Well, I want that booklet. So I'll be there. <laughs> well, Samantha, thank you so much. Do you have any final words for our viewers? It, it's the same thing I say every time. Talking about death will not kill you. We need, <laughs> we need more conversations centered around death and mortality. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much thank for you coming. Thank you for having I me. appreciate it. Uh, the converse, these conversations are a production of North Country Matters filmed at the Fred W. Cleveland uh, Computer Center here at the Potsdam Public Library. This show is a civic collaboration between the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters and the Potsdam Public Library. And until next time, remember, our North Country matters.